Here at legendsofamerica.com is a story entitled The Tragic Story of the Donner Party, written by Kathy Weiser. Let us continue. On July 31st, the party left Fort Bridger, joined by the McCutcheon family. The group now numbered 74 people in 20 wagons. And for the first week, they made good progress at 10 to 12 miles per day. On August 6th, the party reached the Weber River after having passed through Echo Canyon. Here they came to a halt when they found a note from Hastings advising them not to follow him down Weber Canyon, as it was virtually impassable, but rather to take another trail through Salt Basin. While the party kept near modern-day Hennifer, Utah, James Reed, along with two other men, forged ahead on horses to catch up with Hastings. Finding the party at the south shore of the Great Salt Lake, Hastings accompanied Reed partway back to point out the new route, which he said would take them about one week to travel. In the meantime, the Graves family caught up with the Donner Party, which now numbered 87 people in 23 wagons. Taking a vote among the party members, the group decided to try the new trail rather than backtracking to Fort Bridger. On August 11th, the wagon train began the arduous journey through the Wasatch Mountains. Clearing trees and other obstructions along the new path, the new path of their journey. In the beginning, the wagon train was lucky to make even two miles per day, taking them six days to travel just eight miles. Along the way, they discovered that some of their wagons would have to be abandoned, and before long, morale began to sink, and the pioneers began to adamantly blame Lansford Hastings. I think that blame is well put. By the time they reached the shore, they also blamed James Reed. On August 25th, the caravan lost another member, one Lou Colloran, who died of consumption near present-day Grantsville, Utah. About this time, fear began to set in as provisions were running low and time was against them. In the 21 days since reaching the Weber River, they had moved just 36 miles. Five days later, the group began to cross the Great Salt Lake Desert, believing the trek would take only two days, according to Hastings. However, what they didn't know was that the desert sand was moist and deep, where wagons quickly got bogged down, severely slowing their progress. On the third day in the desert, their water supply was nearly as exhausted their water supply was nearly exhausted, and some of the oxen ran away. When they finally reached the end of the grueling desert five days later, on September 4th, the emigrants rested near the base of Pilot Peak for several days. On their 80-mile journey through the Salt Lake Desert, they had lost 32 oxen. Reed was forced to abandon two of his wagons and the Donners as well as a man named Louis Kiesberg, lost one wagon each. On the far side of the desert, an inventory of the food was taken and found less than adequate for the 600-mile trek still ahead. Ominously, snow powdered the mountain peaks that very night. They reached Humboldt River on September 26th. Realizing that the difficult journey through the mountains and the desert had depleted their supplies, two of the young men traveling with the party, Bill McCutcheon and Chuck Stanton, were sent head to Sutter's Fort, California, to bring back supplies. From September 10th through the 25th, the party followed the trail into Nevada, around the Ruby Mountains, finally reaching the Humboldt River on September 26th. It was here that the new quote-unquote trail met up with Hastings' original path. Having traveled an extra 125 miles through strenuous mountain terrain and dry desert, the disillusioned party's resentment of Hastings, Hastings and ultimately Reed was increased tremendously. 
the Donner Party soon reached the junction with the California Trail, about seven miles west of present-day Elko, Nevada, and spent the next two weeks traveling along the Humboldt River. As the disillusionment of the party increased, tempers began to flare. On October 5th at Iron Point, two wagons became entangled, and John Snyder, a teamster of one of the wagons, began to whip his oxen. Infuriated by the teamster's treatment of the oxen, James Reed ordered the man to stop, and when he would not, Reed grabbed his knife and stabbed the teamster in the stomach, killing him. The Donner Party wasted no time in, administ in administering their own justice. Though member Louis Kiesberg favored hanging for James Reed, the group instead voted to banish him. Leaving his family, Reed was last seen riding off to the west with a man named Walter Heron. Probably has a better chance than all the rest of them. The Donner Party continued to travel along the Humboldt River with their remaining draft animals exhausted. To spare the animals, everyone who could walked. Two days after the Snyder killing, Louis Kiesberg turned out a Belgian man named Hardcoop, who'd been traveling with him. The old man who could not keep up with the rest of the party with his severely swollen feet began to knock on other wagon doors, but no one would let him in. He was last seen sitting under a large sagebrush, completely exhausted, unable to walk, worn out, and left to die. The terrible ordeals of the caravan continued to mount, when on the 12th of October their oxen were attacked by Paiute Indians, killing 21 of them with poison-tipped arrows, further depleting their draft animals. Oh, 20, killing 21 oxen. Continuing to encounter multiple obstacles, four days later they reached the gateway to the Sierra Nevada on the Truckee River, present-day Reno, almost completely depleted of food. Miraculously, just three days later, one of the men on the part, one of the men the party had sent on to Fort Sutter, Charles Stanton, returned laden with seven mules loaded with beef and flour. Two Indian guides, and news of a clear but difficult path through the Sierra Nevada. Stanton's partner, William McCutcheon, had fallen ill and remained at the fort. Lucky for him. The caravan camped for five days, 50 miles from the summit, resting their oxen for the final push. Their decision to delay their departure was yet one more of the many that would lead to their tragedy. October 28th, an exhausted James Reed arrived at Sutter's Fort, where he met Bill McCutcheon, now recovered, and the two men began preparations to go back to their families. Was that the, the banished guy, James Reed? Is he coming back? Yeah, that's the guy who was banished. Now he's going to come back. Oh, my goodness. Reed was heading back to the wagon train from which he had been banished. In the meantime, while the wagon train continued to the base of the summit, George Donner's wagon axle broke, and he fell behind the rest of the party. Twenty-two people, consisting of the Donner family and their hired men, stayed behind while the wagon was repaired. Unfortunately, while cutting timber for the new axle, a chisel slipped, and Donner cut his hand badly, causing the group to fall further behind. As the rest of the party continued to what is now known as Donner's Lake, snow began to fall. 
Stanton and the two Indians who were traveling ahead made it as far as the summit, but could go, but could go no further. They found it hopeless and retraced their steps where five feet of new snow had already fallen. Wow. With the Sierra Pass just 12 miles beyond the wagon train after attempting to make the pass through the heavy snow, finally retreated to the eastern end of the lake where level ground and timber was abundant. At the lake stood one existing cabin and realizing how they were stranded, the group built two more cabins, sheltering 59 people in hopes that the snow, that the early snow would melt, allowing them to continue. The 22 people with the Donners were about six miles behind at Alder Creek. Hastily, as the snow continued, the party built three shelters from tents, quilts, buffalo robes, and brush to protect, to protect themselves from the harsh conditions. At Donner Lake, two more attempts were made to get over the pass in 20 feet of snow until they finally realized they were snowbound for the winter. More small cabins were constructed, many of which were shared by more than one family. The weather and their hopes were not to improve. Over the next four months, the remaining men, women, and children would huddle, would huddle together in cabins makeshift lean-tos, and tents. Meanwhile, Reed and McCutcheon had headed back up into the mountains, attempting to rescue the stranded companions. Two days after they started out, it began to rain. To rescue? Wasn't he banished? <laughs> what are they going to do to rescue them? <laughs> When they get there, sorry, I'm laughing. As the elevation increased too early, as the elevation increased too soon, the rain turned to snow and 12 miles from the summit, the pair could go no further. Catching their provisions in Bear Valley, they returned to Sutter's Fort, hoping to recruit more men and supplies for the rescue. However, the Mexican war had drawn away the able-bodied men forcing any further rescue attempts to wait. How about just a provisioning, a provisioning uh, 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 attempt? How about just provisions? Don't worry about the rescue. Just get them food. Not knowing how many cattle the immigrants had lost, the men believed the party would have enough meat to last them several months. On Thanksgiving, it began to snow again, and the pioneers at Donner Lake killed the last of their oxen on November 29th for food. The very next day, five more feet of snow fell, and they knew that any plans for departure were dashed. Many of their animals, including Sutter's mules, had wandered off into the storms, and their bodies were lost under the snow. A few days later, their last few cattle were slaughtered for food, and the party began eating boiled hides, twigs, bones, bark. Some of the men tried to hunt with little success. Excuse me. On December 15th, Basil Williams died of malnutrition, and the group realized that something had to be done before they all died. The next day, five men, nine women, and one child departed on snowshoes for the summit, determined to travel the 100 miles to Sutter's Fort. However, with only meager rations and already weak from hunger, the group faced a challenging ordeal. On the sixth day, their food ran out, and for the next three days, no one ate while they traveled through grueling high winds and freezing weather. One member of the party, Charles Stanton, now snowblind and exhausted, was unable to keep up with the rest and told them to go on. He never rejoined the group. 
A few days later, the party was caught in a blizzard and had great difficulty in keeping a fire lit. Antonio, Patrick Dolan, Franklin Glaves, and Lemuel Murphy soon died, and in desperation, the others resorted to cannibalism. Living off the bodies of those that died, along the path to Sutter's Fort, the snowshoeing survivors were reduced to seven. By the time they reached safety, on the western side of the mountains, on the 19th of January, 1847, only two of the ten men survived, including William Eddy and William Foster, but all five women lived through the journey. Of the eight dead, seven had been cannibalized. Immediately, messages were dispatched to neighboring settlements as area residents rallied to save the rest of the Donner Party. On February 5th, the first relief party of seven men left Johnson's Ranch. And second, and the second, headed by James Reed, left two days later. I think they'll welcome him now. Before, I don't think so. Fourteen days later, the first party reached the lake, finding what appeared to be a deserted camp, until they saw the ghostly figure of a woman. Twelve of the emigrants were dead, and of the forty-eight remaining, Many had gone crazy or were barely clinging to life. However, the nightmare was by no means over. Not everyone could be taken out at one time. And since no pack animals could be brought in, few food supplies were brought. The first relief party soon left with 23 refugees. But during the party's travels back to Sutter's Fort, Two more children died. En route down the mountains, the first relief party met the second relief party coming the opposite way, and the Reed family was reunited after five months. On March 1st, the second relief party finally arrived at the lake, finding grisly evidence of cannibalism. The next day, they arrived at Alder Creek, to find that the Donners had also resorted to cannibalism. Two days later, Reed left the camp with 17 of the starving emigrants, but just two days later, they were caught in another blizzard. When it cleared, Isaac Donner had died, and most of the refugees were too weak to travel. Reed and another rescuer, Hiram Miller, took three of the refugees with them hoping to find food they had stored on the way up. The rest of the prisoners stayed at what would become known as the Starved Camp. I guess that's a foretelling of things to come. Foreboding. Foreshadowing. On March 12th, the third relief was led by William Eddy and William Foster. They reached Starved Camp, where Mrs. Graves and her son Franklin had also died. The three bodies, including that of Isaac Donner, had been cannibalized. The next day, they arrived at the lake camp to find that both of their sons had died. The day following that, they arrived at Alder Creek Camp to find George Donner was dying from an infection in the hand that he had injured carving an axle months before. His wife, Temzine, though in comparatively good health, refused to leave him, sending her three little girls on without her. The relief party soon departed with four more members of the party, leaving those who were too weak to travel. Two rescuers, Jean-Baptiste Trudeau and Nicholas Clark, were left behind to care for the Donners, but they soon abandoned them to catch up with the relief party.
a fourth rescue party set out in late March, but were soon stranded in a blinding snowstorm for several days. In April, on the 17th, the relief party reached the camps to find only Louis Kiesberg alive among the mutilated remains of his former companions. Kiesberg was the last member of the Donner Party to arrive at Sutter's Fort on April 29th. It took two months and four relief parties to rescue the entire surviving Donner Party.